The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts' past, present, or future employers. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's Brian for Breaking Down Security. This week, part two of our discussion with Fred Jennings on vulnerability, equity, vulnerability disclosure process, and disclosure of ODAs is going to continue. Uh, this week, uh, you know, we, we, we get into, uh, you know, I wouldn't say the more higher level discussion, but there's definitely uh, some discussion with management on how to establish these uh, systems. They're not, they're not easy. They're not undertaken lightly. Uh, a lot of a lot of organizations because they're getting bigger they're you know they're not necessarily maturing they're just getting bigger they're starting to talk with third parties about integrating things uh, you know everyone is asking in terms of vendor management or uh, supply chain security what are you doing for vulnerability disclosure process do you have a bug bounty etc and you know there's a lot of times there's a knee jerk reaction of oh well we'll just you know hire a bug crowd or something and make that happen and there's actually a lot of nuance there a lot of a lot of things that need to happen before you can just say yeah we have a bug bounty program there's a lot of ways to do it wrong um, more often than not it's not done correctly and that will often lead you into issues with the press or with reputational damage or what have you, depending on uh, how you choose to handle your response to people sending you vulnerabilities. Uh, I think I think um, we, we talk about that a little bit. Also, uh, we start talking about, in terms of supply chain security, what happens if somebody finds a vulnerability and you are, you know, it's on code that you don't necessarily own. So is that in, you know, within your, your bug bounty? Uh, how do you handle that? If uh, I think we bring up Samsung and Google as an example of Samsung using a custom version of Android, for instance, and if we find a version or an issue in Samsung, um, you know, what happens there? What, what, what should be the response? And obviously, um, I, I don't have visibility into either how Samsung or Google do things, but, uh, it was just an interesting question that we, we kind of, you know, played back and forth with and talked a little bit about. So hope, uh, hope you, you find those things valuable. Maybe your company or your company does software management or software development, and you've got third parties that are, you know, giving you firmware code or something like that. And you, um, that that's a definite risk. You know, how do you handle the response to that? So we talked a little bit about that. All right. Well, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and let us get it started on this. Uh, hope you have a great week. And, uh, so, so one, one thing that I have, I have noticed at least with, uh, at least in my limited experience with, with vulnerability management is, you know, management, you know, sees this buzzword RSA or they, you know, they've, you know, they, they hear something on, on the news about, you know, vulnerability disclosure programs and they'll come to their IT or security departments and say, yeah, we should set up one of those. Yep. And then you, you counter, you know, you, you being the CISO or whatever, and like, okay, great. We need a million dollars, a budget for bug yep. bounties. And, and then they balk on that. Right. Um, it, how do, how do we being, we not, not upper management or, you know, upper middle management, how do we, how do we communicate that, uh, if somebody decides, Hey, we should have one of these things without actually realizing there's a cost involved with that. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's a tricky one. And, you know, th this also gets into, uh, well, let, let's see, where's the best way to come at this one from, um, I, I, I think with, with any sort of initiative around security, that, that's a hard one because, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, if, if you're talking to upper management or, or the board, you know, security, mm -hmm. much like legal, is primarily a cost item. Um, right. right. People are typically not, you know, with, with, with relatively few exceptions, you know, you, you've maybe got a reputational boost by being a company with a, a reputation for really good security. But, right. You know, in a in a land in a market full of you know a lot of different actors offering the similar service, that's rarely going to be the thing that swings people. Um, right. So you know, it, it, until something goes horribly wrong and there is a million spotlights on the company saying, "Look at how terrible this breach was." You know, here's everyone's credit card data everywhere. Now people are fleeing, market values tanking. You know, right. it's it's a cost item until it becomes extremely necessary and. 
I think this is one of those areas where legal and security at companies have a lot of uh, sort of cultural alignment in terms of how how to navigate those things. Right. Um, you know, I think I think proactively, um, you know, if, if it's sort of the start of that conversation with upper management saying, hey, we should really do this. I, I think it's an educational task in, in the first mm -hmm. instance there to say, mm -hmm. well, you know, sure, we can. But here is what it's going to cost to run that program. Here's what we need for reward payouts to be, you know, competitive with other companies with similar security postures or, you know, sort of similar market values. Um, here, here's the amount of sort of just work hours it's going to take, right. you know, laying out, laying out sort of the real, the reality of how much it costs and laying out the reality of the benefits. Um, there are certainly companies for which, you know, bug bounty is just not going to be the best solution. Um, right. So yeah. I think there's, there's, yeah, there's sort of that judgment call of, you know, is this, sure, it's a hot topic, but is this really what is the right place to put, you know, security resources? Right, right. And, and you know, the, the, the one thing is there's, there's, there's costs, not, not just the cost of setting up like a budget to be able to pay for the bounties, but it's like, you know, if, if you're a security person and you're involved anywhere in the agile pipeline, let's say you, you release software, for instance, or you, you've yep. got a hardware device or something. Um, you could you could pretty much figure out how much money you're going to pay out per year in bug bounties by looking at the backlog of yep. your you know the the stuff that didn't make it in the latest release and you could go well okay here's 15 buffer overflows and oh here's something that could potentially be an RCE you know the if a security researcher who has in inestimable amounts of time looking at your product found these yep. vulnerabilities you know, what is this going to cost us? You know, if they found this RCE, this is, you know, X. So, um, you know, if you have management who comes to you and goes, oh, well, we need this bug bounty program because we need to align with, you know, this project or, you know, this third party wants to integrate with us or partner with us, but, you know, they need these things from us to do so. You can say, okay, great. These 15 vulnerabilities that still exist in the thing we just shipped you right. know, it's going to cost us $250,000. So we're going to need half a million dollars because that's what the security researchers are going to look for, for that. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And yeah, you know, I think, I think that that's another good example where like, if you've got security tech debt that you're already aware of, you know, a bug bounty program may not be as helpful as you think, because it's, you know, it may just rediscover things you already know. It's right. going to take time and resources away from the people right. who, you know, might otherwise be going to solve those already known issues. Um, and yeah, like that, that is an extremely case by case judgment call of, right. you know, right. where do you put those resources? I, I think the other thing that's easy to, to forget with uh, a company who's just sort of looking to get a bug bounty or vulnerability disclosure program off the ground is, you know, sure, it's all well and good to get the policy up there, post it, have that sort of standing there, but mm -hmm. you need, you know, you need people internally who will monitor, will you know, monitor those reports, review those reports, determine, you know, if you do have sort of a nuanced payout for your bounty, you know, people nice. need to be able to determine sort of, you know, oh, this one's real and get this level of payout. This one's, you know, something that we patched and fixed a year ago. Why are they even talking about it? Um, right. And this one is, you know, practically a spam email through the bug bounty program about you know, something that they, you know, tweaked in, in the, you know, view source editor uh, that doesn't actually affect <laughs> anyone. Um, State of Missouri. Hello. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's, it's not just a one-time cost to stand up a program and it's not just an occasional cost of paying out rewards. It's right. a ongoing cost and, and, and also like staffing cost of making sure you've got people who, actually actively run the program, make the kind of complicated case-by-case -case calls on that program and sort of keep things moving on fixing right. it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your bug bounty is actually going to pay like, you're, you're going to end up paying three, four times what, what yep. you, you may pay 50,000 to that security researcher, but then, you know, there's the tech debt incurred, there's the yep. press debt incurred, there's the legal debt and risk debt incurred. So, you know, you may end up being, you know, paying, you know, $250,000 for a simple cross-site scripting if, uh, depending on the, yep. the vulnerabilities there. Yeah. Yep. And, 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 I think, and I think of that early stage, that sort of under, 
that, that, that undervaluing of the program cost, I think, is what kind of ultimately puts a lot of companies in this uh, unfortunate position of, you know, really only being budgeted to offer, you know, the T-shirt or the company branded mug to the critical right. security vulnerability. And, right. you know, that's the sort of stuff that, that makes your outside research researchers say, oh, well, I'm going to go, you know, spend my efforts elsewhere, whether that's dropping your vaults on, on the dark web or just going to someone else on the, you know, bug crowd list of, of paid programs. <laughs> e either way, now you've got a, now you've got a bug bounty program and all that cost and none of the benefits. Yep. Yeah, it would almost be cheaper for you to run a 1099 on the security researcher and hire them as a contractor and then, you know, yep, you know, precisely. Hire, hire them on that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, like, I think, I think that's, that, that's where it becomes a, a difficult conversation is like, at the end of the day, for the budget that you're likely to get, it's only sometimes going to be the right call to spend that on, you know, third party bug bounty programs. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so I have been, uh, you know, I work, I work at a company that does a lot of work with integrators, uh, bringing in mm -hmm. third party code. Uh, we've, we've had, uh, um, uh, Dr. Alan, uh, Friedman on talking about, you know, S bombs and stuff, you know, making sure that third party code and modules come in. Um, when, when, so at GitHub, you probably work, you worked a lot. I don't know if you, you know, are uh, privy to all this, but you worked with a lot of third parties potentially because you integrate their code, you use their modules or what have you. Yep. Um, how, how difficult is it if you're in that position to have a bug bounty and let's say the vulnerability that's introduced is not even code that you own or yep. um, is, is, you know, you're a reseller or let's say you're like Samsung and you have your own flavored Android and the, the vulnerabilities in Android. So security right. researchers can disclose that to Google as an Android bug, but then they can also double dip to Samsung and say, Hey, I found this vulnerability in your, in your crap. Uh, you need to fix this. Uh, what does Samsung do for a bug bounty if it affects Android code as well, I, I mean, is is that just a sad fact of life that they're going to have to pay out as well? Uh, so th this is this is an interesting question in in both parts because I, th I think they're slightly different. Uh, whether you're talking about sort of an upstream service like you know, the, in like the Android to Samsung example, right, or right, a downstream right. vendor, right. Um, right. the the question of when and whether to include third party services within the scope of one's bug bounty is another complicated one. Um, mm -hmm. The, I, th I think that, I think the stance that we took at GitHub was, and, and I'm going off memory here. So if I've sure. completely misquoted my own, my own bounty program, uh, apologies, but I, I think usually the stance that was taken was, you know, third party services are not necessarily in scope for the bug bounty. Um, mm. it, that is, that, that does not violate the, safe harbor section necessarily unless we think you're like intentionally targeting this third this third party mm -hmm. um but that as far as as far as payouts um, you know sort of took the position that you know if it's with a third party thing that we use really your your bounty concern is with them and you need to go to them right. for for that bounty or, or, or you can go to us but the result is going to be you know we either put you in touch with that third party through their program or, you know, uh, insulate you and, you know, yeah, like it, it, it would, it would not result in a payout to, to the researcher necessarily if it was a third party service, just cause it's, you know, no longer a, you know, it's no longer a company of vulnerability. It's a sort right. of internalized vulnerability from this third party. Um, right. I think that's trickier in the Samsung situation and, I'm trying to think of if I have any firsthand dealing with that type of situation. Um, you know, I think the uh, and, and and you know the the Samsung the Android one is also an interesting one because I don't have any sense of whether there are lines of communication between the two. Um, right, right, right. You know, if I'm if I'm Samsung if I'm Samsung security and I you know on, on the Android team and have some contacts at Google who I can sort of uh, quietly go to and say, hey, we got this interesting vulnerability report on this kind of topic. Are you already aware of this? And they say, oh, yeah, you know, person with the same screen name told us about that last week. Uh, um, yeah. You know, if, as long as we've drafted our policy cleverly, 
maybe what I go back and say is, hey, you know, we're aware that there's already already a fix in the works on this, and that you already reported it to, you know, the actual root cause of of the bug. Um, right. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, I think that's much. If you don't have that line of communication, I think that's a much harder question, and probably be sort of safer thing to do is yeah, just you know, evaluate that like any other report and. You know, ideally have some permission in your policy that allows you to talk to this, you know, superior vendor service. Right, right. And and just to be fair for all the listeners, I don't I don't know how Google and Samsung do things either. Um, I, I yeah. Don't, but I would assume, you know, that there is some kind of communication or discussion there. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. with with regards to how things work, they probably have some kind of partnership to you know share any kind of vulnerabilities between one another because you yep. know. They, they, they would have to have some kind of data sharing or information sharing there. So, um, yeah, and it would just make sense now, of course, I, you know, being big companies, there may be a lot of things that don't make sense there, but yep. um, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> uh, I, I think, so I, 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 I had a question down here and I was just kind mm-hmm. of thinking out loud in a perfect world, what does, a disclosure look like, uh, and, and not to use the word responsible disclosure, because that's, you know, in yep. 2021, we're still using that term and nobody knows what the real answer to that is. And yeah. also same lines of what the hell a pen test versus a red team is. We're still having those kinds of ignorant oh, arguments yeah. on, on Twitter, yep. but in, in your opinion, from a, from a legal point of view, uh, what would a responsible disclosure look like in, in the best sense of the word in the platonic, in the, in the platonic, uh, not platonic, but in, in Plato's ideal, you know, uh, uh, you know, way, what does that look like for you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think my leading, que- my, my, uh, cheeky response to that question is, is the follow-up question, uh, ideal or best for who? Um, if if we're talking about best for the company, uh, probably the one where the researcher does it for free and signs an NDA that says they will go to the grave with every last detail of their vulnerability, you know, tightly sealed. Um, if we're talking about good for, right. Um, if we're talking about sort of (laughs) good for, uh, I think, I think, you know, if, if, if I, if I take the question sort of as what sort of ideal and best for security generally and, and the ability of people and companies to protect themselves from, you know, malicious actors with the same knowledge and information. Mm-hmm. Um, if I think of what I'd look for in sort of a perfect uh, disclosure policy, I think it would be something that, uh, if it has any sort of embargo at all, tailors that very carefully to the question of how long would it take to fix this and how many people would potentially be in fact be affected. Hmm. Um, you know, I think it, it is, you know, I, I think that that question of, you know, what does, what does, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll use the loaded term so someone can get angry about, about it uh, at me at, <laughs> on Twitter later. Um, but what does sort of responsible disclosure looks like? I, I think that varies a lot depending on what's being disclosed. Hmm. Um, you know, to, to use that example from before, if, if it's, you know, if it's uh, Widgets Inc. who's misconfigured their, their S2 bucket, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that's not a global risk. That's a very company specific risk. Um, right. Maybe they've put sensitive data up there and there are individuals who'd be affected. But, you know, it's, it's also a pretty quick, it's a quick and well-known fix. Um, if we're talking a novel O'Day in a Zen hypervisor that's used in thousands of systems worldwide. That's a very different situation. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think like in in those sort of broader impact situations, you know, as far as how much havoc are you creating for the rest of the world? uh, That's a, you know, that has a very different answer uh, depending on whether that is a vulnerability disclosed with, you know, a shruggy emoji saying good luck or a vulnerability disclosed with clear instructions on, instructions on how to patch or mitigate the risk. Um, okay. Okay. So yeah, I, I think like the, the first aspect would be, you know, if, 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 we're, if we're limiting security researcher speech, it should be done uh, really only when there is a clear and substantiated need for that. 
not in a way that just allows places to sweep these disclosures under the rug. Um, I think in order to kind of keep this type of, this sort of corner of the research industry working and flowing, um, mm -hmm. I think that internal process to sort of accurately and appropriately value different types of disclosures is necessary. Um, right. You know, if, if you're offering any sort of pad at all, it's only really effective if you have the expertise to, to say, you know, here's what this kind of bug is worth to us. And have the inter internal process and business support to, you know, get the budget for that. Right. Um, I, th I think that's absolutely key. Um, and, and, okay. and then, you know, sort of like we were talking before, I think if, if there is that kind of, kind of public interest embargo process, you know, uh, having like some mechanism for information sharing to concern third parties is, is very helpful. Um, one, th one thing that remains difficult um, with bug bounty programs is that example you gave of, you know, hey, you've reported to us, but really the, the root of this vulnerability is in a vendor service or some other third party where, mm -hmm. you know, I, I may have the best bug bounty program policy ever written and, you know, the security researchers might really like it. It might be extremely fair. But if this concerns a third party, that only, you know, my bug bounty program can't automatically bind that third party. That that right. becomes sort of a trickier question of, you know, lines of communication and company relationships and circles of trust. And, you know, I think having having some language in there to cover for those kind of cases where a third party needs to be involved in order to, to fix the problem. Um, I think that's also pretty key to to do carefully and do right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I I'm I, I'm seeing this with and we and we talked last year. We had uh, the the folks who helped write some of the Ripple Twenty stuff. You know, where uh -huh. they're using you know IoT security, but they're using you know TCP stacks that are thirty years old from a company yep. that may or may not exist anymore. And you know, it's a systemic issue across you know environments. Uh, you know, ICS and medical devices are also seeing this. So yep. you know you. You got a you got a disclosure of a vulnerability. Hey, your TCP stack will do blah if I send a malformed packet, and it's like, well, we can't we can't fix that. And oh, where we're using an old piece of software, it it it's almost getting to where, when we're triaging, uh, for vulnerabilities in our in our environments, you know, our, our technical debt, we should start assigning a you know, a potentially a value to that. I mean, we do it with story points and stuff like that, like level effort yeah. to fix, but we should say. Hey, this 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 is going to take us forty thousand dollars to fix now, yep. or it's going to cost us eighty thousand dollars in the open market when a security researcher comes to us. And you know, in terms of prioritizing these these issues for for launch uh, of devices or services or, or apps or what have mm -hmm. you, um, I, I I think I think that's an excellent idea, and I, especially in sort of an embedded devices context, like you mentioned, where right. you know, let's like post you know post release or, or post sale updates are sometimes very difficult to push and very hard right. to make consistent. That's a, right. yeah, that, that's a perfect example of a area where that kind of forward thinking valuation of the preventive measures you could take would be huge. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So um, we, we, we have a, a little bit of time left here. One of, one of the things and one of the reasons that this inspired these shows was uh, Randery's discussion of why zero days are essential to security. And mm -hmm. uh, they put a blog post out saying, we believe, you know, we should be, you know, finding this stuff. You know, they, I, I don't know if they buy and sell O days, um, you know, whether they do or not right now is, is outside what I would consider the scope of this, but they do do, uh, zero day exploit, you know, research and looking for mm -hmm. things in various products. Um, and, uh, somebody had mentioned on Twitter that, Hey, you know, are you using O days during pen testing? And, and, and somebody had, you know, there was the, the debate of you shouldn't use O days during pen testing because, you know, there's no defense against that. Or, um, you know, is it just, you know, you can't really find anything really wrong during the assessment and you need to, you know, show up the, the company that you actually know what you're doing. Um, uh, is, and, and, uh, you know, from, from my point of view, I, I would say you shouldn't use something that people don't 
know they need a defense against, or, you know, I, I can see them using the O'Days against existing defenses to see if that O'Day would be blocked, maybe you yep. know, testing for that. Um, but using an O'Day and not having a way to, to mitigate that, it's like, oh, well, we used an O'Day, we popped you, and there's no real way to patch that, you know, and, and we've seen that right. with things like, you know, uh, it seems a little on the irresponsible side. So I was just thinking from a, a, a legal point of view, how, how would a company who uses O'Days uh, for engagements or something like that, and I'm sure it does happen once in a while, but um, how, how can they, how, what, what is kind of legal footing there for them if they decided that that was their, their, their milieu, they, they, that was what they wanted to do? Yeah, I, I th- that's, a, that's an interesting legal question because you know, it, it, it kind of gets into why did the company ask for a pen test in the first place? Right. And you know, I think, I, I, think I, I, I like the point you made earlier about um, you know, if you've got sort of a, you know, an IDS or some other like defensive system set up, sure, it would be really interesting for you know, a company's security posture to know whether that's sufficient to protect against some, you know, unknown O'Day as opposed to your sort of laundry list of known vulnerabilities. Um, right. From a, you know, from a, from a legal perspective, you know, a lot of the business demand for security for outside security testing is compliance driven. So, you know, if I'm, right. if I'm looking to be able to, to say to company management, Hey, like just talk to the InfoSec team and we're good to go on the SOC 2 audit. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I I don't think either security or legal or or the business team would be terribly happy to, you know, hear that the outside testing company gave us a fail because they found that something was not protected against an O day. But right. Right. you know, I guess like it sort of gets into you know, are you are you trying to just improve your, your security posture or you're doing this sort of as part of a larger you know security or or legal compliance need uh, or certification need where you know that may be just outside the usual professional scope of what that's looking for um i I think it's it's also an interesting question because you know i I guess like the follow-up i'd want i would be curious to know is like in this situation where you know outside pen tester is using is burning it burning an o-day on you know my company's audit right you know are, are are they then disclosing that that o-day to us um, are right. they disclosing that publicly? You know, are they, you know, if, if this is just, we're going to use it and tell you, you failed and give you no information about what we did or how, you know, right. that seems a little more, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like quite as fair play as, as if, you know, yeah, if you're going to use this thing now, it is also publicly disclosed and no longer an O-Day. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, yeah. would also like, you know, if I, if I am a company and somebody does use something in their war chest of, you know, O'Day uh, related items, can I then go to Snort or Cisco and say, Hey, I, I just had this pen test and they use this on me. Do you right. know about this? Yep. Um, you know, you need to fix this now because, you know, we have X, you know, X, you know, X, you know, we have this vulnerability and you've, you know, and then now Cisco has been alerted to it. And then you know, right. I can definitely see a, a press brouhaha come on, come on over. This. I, I can see a press brouhaha. I, I, and depending on the terms of the contract with this, with the, this outside security provider, I can see a legal brouhaha over it too. You know, if, if I've signed really? some NDA with, with my outside security consultant saying, you know, I will not disclose the detailed process and methods used in, you know, this this penetration test mm. and i then run to cisco with with information you know let, let's say like I, I go give cisco the logs of you know what it looked like when the, when this piece you know when this oday was was used right uh you know if, if someone came to me as company legal and said hey here's what just happened and here's who we told about it uh that's a tough call you know i think right. there's there's this strong sort of public interest in you know security disclosure of, of novel vulnerabilities. And at the same time that, you know, that may or may not outweigh the uh, enforceability of that NDA. So. Right. 
And, and, you know, depending on uh, who you use for things like monitoring detection, you know, um, yep. not, not to toot horns, but, you know, Miss Berlin works for a company that uh, excels in trying to find things exactly like this. And right. if they're, if they're monitoring your logs for you and, you know, you're like, Hey, we got a pen test coming up and, you know, Blue Mara or whoever is like, Oh yeah, we'll, we'll be on the lookout for stuff like that. And then they burn that O day. Now you've yep. got like potentially four parties involved trying to, you know, you know, make sure that, you know, this, this is not being found. So yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, that, that's a neat one. I'm, I'm, I'm following, following this one away in, in my, in my pocket full of legal scenarios <laughs> that would be interesting to tabletop exercise with the security team. Uh, uh, so, okay. So that's, that's an interesting question too. the tabletops. Um, you're, you're a legal person. Uh, you know, when I did, uh, when I did, uh, legal, uh, or IR tabletops at uh, the other company I mentioned with you, the, uh, um, we, we quickly had legal involved in, yep. in, in, in that respect. And, and only because of the place I worked at was, you know, having to deal with, you know, the, the fuzzy bears and the, the vehement pandas and what have you, right. if you will. <laughs> um, um, during an incident response like that, what, uh, what, for you, what, what, what do you like to see from a company in, in regards to that? Cause a lot of your legal response also would kind of dovetail into potentially PR and, yep. and, and notifying customers kind of stuff. Like, you know, we want to frame this, you know, wording or this statement just so, so that we're not either opening ourselves up to litigation or, yep. uh, you know, you're, you're not necessarily legal. You're also, uh, risk reduction, if you will, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, m- much like security in an incident response, legal ends up wearing, wearing a few different hats, and maybe one of them is a bit larger or heavier than the others. But yeah, I mean, you're, I think you are often a key collaborative point on what's the business risk, what's the financial risk, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. what's what's the PR risk, and you know, I've, I've I've been involved in a lot of incident response processes as legal, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, I think the the best elements of, of that interaction um, are, you know, I, I think I, ideally legal is both there to as quickly as possible sort of analyze and answer the core legal questions around a, around a, a security incident, such as, right. you know, was customer data affected and accessed? And if so, you know, do we need to, to legally consider this a breach? Do we need to you know, does this touch any relevant data data privacy regulations that require us to disclose it either to an attorney general's office or to the users or to both or you know just kind of kind of play ringleader on the legal analysis of the type of security incident that's occurred and determine right. if there's sort of specific follow-up steps. But I think also, you know, to be kind of a collaborative voice and a a perspective and also sort of a, a load lightener for security. Um, you know, to go to PR, to go to the business team or to go to management and say, you know, hey, here's more or less what we're seeing. Here's a short summary of the relevant information for you. You know, what should we do? Or is there someone on your end that we should loop in? And, right. you know, I think uh, I've, I've been in, in, in the places I've worked or the clients I've had, I've, I've, I've been quite lucky in that I've gotten to work with great security teams who, who sort of understand that it's not just, you know, someone scrolling through logs. It's also someone, you know, knowing when to sort of ring the alarm bell and pull in more of the company. And, uh, right. you know, I, I think that there's also, I don't know, most of the security people I've worked with have a very good sense of uh, at least in broad strokes, you know, what sorts of things legal needs to know about sort of as soon as possible. Um, and, and having, you know, I think just having a good relationship between the legal and the security and the instant security team is, is really key because, you know, on one hand, you as, as legal, like I don't ever want to slow down response to an incident, mm-hmm. but I also want to be, you know, looped in and aware and, Sort of, I, I want to have the information feed that me and my legal team need to, you know, sort of r- run back up on those potentially big risk questions of, you know, do we need to report this? If so, how? Just all, right. you know, all, all that rundown. And, you know, I think, I think in some ways, especially for the post incident cleanup stages, um, it can be a real boon for actually getting stuff fixed too. Because, 
Um, I think legal is often in, in a very good position to say to sort of the upper management team, hey, here's why this one gets high priority for you know budgeting or outside help for, for mediating. Um, right, right. Yeah, we or, sort of get. Hmm? Yeah, or or you know after you know during the lessons learned for the incident response, uh, you may take a look at contracts and realize well what we signed with that company or with you know with that group yep. doesn't really protect us in the, in the long run. So we need to you know renegotiate that contract or you know the the relationship we have with them is is fairly poisonous. So we should probably look at you know alternatives to 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 fixing yep. that. Um, I, I, in, in my experience, in my, in my career, I, I've often used, uh, not used legal, but I've often referred to legal when uh, things, you know, they're almost like the third party pen tests that come in. It's like, okay, you know, I'm telling, I'm telling management, I'm telling my upper, you know, level folks, hey, we need to fix this. And then we bring in the third party and they say, hey, you need to fix this. And management's like, oh, yes, we need to fix that immediately. Yep. I've often yep. used legal as the Hey, this represents a business risk and nobody's answering. And then I go, Hey, legal person, you know, yep. we're doing X. And then legal's like, Oh, no, 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 we don't. No, we're not doing that anymore. No and, uh, you know, then people listen. So, uh, yep. yeah. Yep. No, I, I, I've seen a few examples of that with, you know, I, I think one of the very common examples is, you know, some vendor pr program or service that keeps being right. the source of security incidents. It can be right. that legal voice right. that puts it just right. like, just over the edge to actually get yep. budget to replace yep. them. Yep. But yeah, any number of situations where like, yeah, having, you know, I, I think there's, the, m m you know, I think both legal and security ha have a lot of uh, unhelpful stereotypes with, with certain other mm -hmm. parts of the business team mm -hmm. um, yep. where, you know, just one asking for something can, depending on what the thing is, is, oh, you know, security is making noise about this again or legal is complaining about this contract. But if both are speaking at once I, 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 and making the same point, I yeah, I've also seen that generally get pretty good results from sort of the decision making pieces of a company. Fantastic. All right. You know, um, I I don't have much of anything else. Do you have any uh, last thoughts before we go? Oh, let's see. You know, I, I think the 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 only other thought I'd sort of put as a as sort of cap on this discussion is is one that we touched on before, which is. You know, I think it, it's really easy for uh, companies to sort of focus on the vulnerability disclosure process and the bug bounty program and, and these pieces of it. And, you know, sort of that, that, that reality of, of the tough judgment call uh, about, you know, whether that's really better spent as, as resource on those programs or just on bulking up your security team and sort of doing the fundamentals better is a really tough call. And, you know, I think one of the right. big takeaways for, you know, especially anyone in sort of that small to medium stage company world of things. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think like it's important to, to make that call carefully because, right. you know, at the, at the end of the day, what your, what your disclosure program is, is an open door to people to come and say, Hey, we want to help you out. And, mm -hmm. you know, you need both the internal processes to actually take that help. And you need to know that that's actually going to be better for you than just bringing in more people to help full time. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, Fred, thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming on. Uh, you know, I, I know that I, I, when I ask this question, it's not so that they can ask you legal advice, but if people <laughs> wanted to discuss with you, uh, the, some of this, and, you know, maybe hit you up on Twitter, you know, about what responsible disclosure means to you, how they do so. Yeah, sure. You know, what I'll do is I'll, 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 I'll drop you a link to both the bug bounty program that I put together, um, as well as my contact info in, uh, so you can toss those in the show notes, but okay. probably like the easiest way to toss me just sort of a casual contact is probably Twitter. It's, it's Esquiring on there. Okay. Very cool. All right. Excellent. Um, yeah. So, uh, I do appreciate you uh, taking the time on a Saturday morning here to, or now Saturday afternoon for you, but, uh, yeah, I appreciate you, uh, you coming on and joining me. Uh, to, to yeah, of course. This. Thanks so much for having me on. It was a real bunch of really interesting questions.